treat yourself to a little something organic. Cora's Whisper Thin Yet Mighty Absorbent Pads have a breathable 100% organic cotton top sheet and are made without fragrance, dyes, and chlorine. Because your vulva's not a hot tub. With patented smart channels for up to eight hours of leak protection, Cora's got you covered however you flow. Plus, Cora donates period products to people in need with every purchase. Find Cora at Target, CVS, and online at cora.life and save 15% now with Target Circle. Welcome to the ninth episode of the Meet the Mancunian podcast, Social Impact Stories from Manchester. This is the fourth season. I'm Deepa Thomas Sutcliffe, your friendly host. On the streets and nooks of Manchester, my inspiring Mancunian guests tackle their causes with their grit and passion. They are leaders, worker bees and community hosts and they share their stories to inspire you all through this season. Relax, grab a brew and listen in to the Meet the Mancunian podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify or any of your favorite podcasting platforms. You can also check out all the episodes on my new website www.meetthemancunian.co.uk I wanted to take a moment to introduce the podcast's new expanded name. It's now the Meet the Mancunian podcast, Social Impact Stories from Manchester. I've added social impact stories in the title to make it easier for listeners to know what the podcast is about. And what some of my new listeners may not know is that Mancunians are people from Manchester, UK. I hope you like the new title. It makes it easier for you to find the podcast when you're looking for those great social impact stories to inspire your own dreams and passions. And then back to the ninth episode, looking to support health and well-being of the community. We hear from Charles Kwaku Odoi. Chief Officer, Caribbean and African Health Network in this episode. I'm delighted to introduce my guest, Charles Kwaku Odoi, Chief Officer, Caribbean and African Health Network. Thanks so much, Charles, for taking the time today. Thanks, Deepa, for the opportunity. Looking forward to learning about all the work you're doing, but maybe just start with telling us about your passion for health and how did that get started? Oh, thanks, Uh, so uh, I think uh, I have a few hats on, and uh, in you know among the various roles, I'm a church leader, and uh, you know of a Pentecostal independent Pentecostal church. And over the years, I have obviously had congregation members who have been unwell, but I have had friends and family members as well. And yeah, I'm heavily involved in interfaith work, and I remember. Back in uh, 2010, 11, thereabout, I had a phone call from someone working for an HIV organization in London and really wanted to run a a workshop for black church leaders in in Manchester and ask if I would come along. And I did go along, you know, to learn about HIV and uh, some of the issues and the challenges and it was a real eye opener knowing that hiv there was a high prevalence in the black african community but not much progress compared to other you know communities where there was high prevalence and so that was the start of a journey and for me personally it was about utilizing yes so 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 the workshop around hiv and hearing about the transmission but some of the issues and and the challenges and and the fact that it has been difficult to reach the black community around awareness raising health promotion. And I just thought to myself, being a church leader and having lots of, you know, pastor friends, I should be able to speak to them and help raise those issues. And so for me, that's where it started. And it, it was a whole journey, had to go to London, you know, o- over the next two years, been learning myself, but also thinking through how I could engage other church leaders and other community leaders around the subject of health. It then led to running HIV clinics in churches on Sundays, which was quite unheard of. So went through a, a real journey. And so in 2017, when the chair of the Caribbean African Health Network 
invited me to a workshop and she was talking about a PhD that was looking at poorer cardiovascular outcomes and why black people tend to have poorer outcomes. I went along and it was quite moving and touching. Once again, a real focus on the black community. And I, I did offer to join the organization and, you know, five years down the line, uh, you know, so. That's how that's how it happened. Okay, that's a that's a really great story, and it's lovely that it started with your church and your interfaith work, and you know, really supporting the community. So, tell us about the uh, about Khan or the Caribbean and African Health Network. What is it focused on, and uh, you know, what what does it do day to day? Yeah, so so the Caribbean African Health Network, Khan for sure was formed in 2017 on the back of our chair, Dr. Faye Bruce's PhD. As I mentioned before, she was looking at cardio, why black people tend to have poorer cardiovascular outcome. It was just around the start of devolution in Greater Manchester. So many will know we had a devolved health and social care budget of six billion. And as Dr. Faye Bruce was running her PhD focus groups, we were asking what she was gonna do with the data. And saying time and time again, they get consulted and nothing happens. They don't hear back. They don't know what their contribute, you know, their views and experiences they share. They don't know where that ends up. And she committed to do something and not allow her PhD to sit on a shelf. But the more focus groups you run, the more people ask the same question. So lo and behold, 10 people came together, set up a CIC because that was quicker to set up a CIC than a, a registered charity. And so Khan has a vision of eradicating health inequalities and wider disparities for Caribbean African people within a generation. And the whole mission is leading some of those strategic conversations and discussions on behalf of our Black community so that commissioners, service providers, statutory bodies will have the skill set and, and be supported to develop, you know, that equity of access for the black community. So there's a real focus on the wider social determinants of health. And that's how someone's education, housing, social status, you know, all those things where someone lives, how that impacts on their health and well-being. So that's what Khan has been focused on pre-pandemic. And so we say the pandemic hasn't really taught us anything new. It gave us a seat around the table because it, from 2017, we're trying to shine a light on some of the you know disparities and, and inequalities. At the moment, we have sort of five areas of work. We're looking at community engagement and empowerment. We have a range of health and well-being services and programs. We also into education, training, and leadership development. Then there's the whole aspect of infrastructure and capacity building for other Black-led organizations. And then research and innovation, because that was what started the organization anyway. Thank you so much for sharing that and that mission of eradicating inequalities in health provision You know, within a generation. That's very powerful and Good luck to you. That's a very big mission. And I hope uh, Khan and your like-minded organizations uh, can do that. Uh, It's much needed. Can I ask about what challenges you may have faced on this journey? Because obviously, while you have noble missions, sometimes you have challenges. And through those challenges, maybe there are some learnings you can share with listeners. We have listeners now from 41 countries, including Kenya, which is the only African uh, country listening in. But there are people of uh, Caribbean and African descent around the world. They might be listening in as well. Yeah, so clearly, and and for many charities it's all about resource and 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 you know the funding and and for us as an organization looking at where we started and without any huge core funding it has been difficult knocking on doors saying oh the caribbean african community has you know huge disparities so twice more likely to have stroke more likely to have liver failure you know, are women more likely to have endometriosis? And it goes on and on and on. And pre-pandemic, it, it, it was like, you know, uh, 
pushing a closed door. But then with the pandemic and, you know, the disproportionate impact of COVID, it meant that there was a real opportunity. So for us as an organization, what we've learned is the, you know, the power of being focused and and saying the same thing so long as the evidence base is there. So we very much focus on the data. Being proactive is really important because, and I share with people, at the start of the pandemic in March 2020, we had three part-time staff working two days, three days, two days. But because we were willing to respond to the challenge at stake and to support our community, we've now, you know, grown to 48 members of staff. We've experienced exponential growth, both in staffing, but also the services we deliver, as well as obviously you know, income generation. And and it's because we were willing to respond. So for example, in March, 2020, before the first lockdown was announced, we sent an e-bulletin to our, you know, audience on our database saying, if you are a black person and you have sickle cell and high blood pressure and others, then make sure you look after yourself. And I, I always say that I personally haven't, a child, a son with asthma. I stopped him from going to school way before government, you know, came up with the clinically extremely vulnerable yeah. group. So by being proactive and engaging with our community, but also what that afforded us was to build trust. So then when it got to the time where we had to encourage people from our community for the vaccine trial, as well as the, you know, vaccine rollout, we already had a relationship of trust. We started organizing fortnightly meetings, but also we knew the importance of people having ethnic foods. So we started speaking to various funders and we're buying them in bulk, or the Caribbean African in bulk, giving it to church groups, community groups to redistribute. And so when we had to have a difficult conversation around the vaccine and saying that was the, you know, only scientifically, you know, viable option. People knew that the trust was already there. Also, we started running weekly webinars, you know, health webinars. So we've been running that since the 2nd of May 2020, where we have a black doctor speaking to the community and answering their questions. And we didn't just focus on COVID. We have six health priority areas where we know the data is is quite stacked when it comes to our community. And because of the weekly webinars we're running, when we were asked to support with the vaccines rollout on the 16th of January, one of our Saturday morning sessions, we ended up with a thousand people on Zoom, 800 across YouTube and Facebook. Yeah. And at any time, any point in time during the one and a half hour webinars, we were all, we had people wanting to join, you know, on Zoom. But then the moment we had the vaccines minister join, we lost about 50 <laughs> people. And for us, that shows that our people, they want to hear people who look like them tell them the truth. So these yeah. things have enabled us build trust with with our community. And I think, you know, having the wheel to dream is also important. And last year, for the first time, because we were trying to punch above our weight and responding to the needs of our community, we run a grants program for Caribbean African-led organizations across Greater Manchester. Obviously, we had local support, but we did apply to Comic Relief. And, and we gave distributed 310,000 in grants of 5, 10, and 15. It was the first time a Black-led organization was administering funds to other Black-led organizations. So it has been difficult, but if you keep you know, responding to the needs of the community, if you keep that your focus, then, you know, where there's a mm. wheel, there is a way. And, you know, it's something we have been able to demonstrate through our work. Thanks so much for sharing that. And, you know, you've brought me very well to a question about the impact you're making, obviously, through the funds that you're doing through the uh, COVID uh, education, because I know that the BME community were very, they were less likely to take the vaccine and they were more like because obviously I also come from an Indian background myself 
and I was very interested in that. I was very concerned about why that was happening. And it's great to know that you were able to build that trust and, you know, influence people to to take that step. What impact would you say you've made besides the big milestones that you've shared so far? Is there anything you want to call out? Yeah, so we, we were really privileged as, as part of having built trust. Around the vaccination, we went right from just giving information to having our nurses put jabs in the arms. So we run six clinics in the city of Salford. You know, we did our own flyers, okay. publicity, knocking on doors, interviews on radio station. We had volunteers on the street. We sourced venues. And then the local health body, the CCG, gave, came along with the vaccines. And we, one of the unique selling points of about Khan is access to, you know, volunteer nurses and doctors up and down the country across all specialities. And so for us, our strap line has been how we influence policy and practice. So in practice, we have clinicians giving their time. And the Saturday morning webinars, every Saturday morning between 11 and 12.15 or 12.30, live on Zoom, stream to YouTube and Facebook, it means we're increasing the health literacy of our community. Because we keep asking, what can we do without money? If we had no money at all, knowledge is power, but also health is wealth. And if we can, so telling people about their numbers, you know, encouraging people to be physically active and to look at what they eat and the assault content. So that health literacy aspect, it has been phenomenal. But also we've created jobs for, for those and, and, you know, our organization is black led. We, we have, you know, the 40, 47, 48 people, you know, predominantly from different African and Caribbean, you know, nationalities. And that seems to be going well. We responded to calls from church leaders in the first wave of the pandemic. And so at the moment, we run a black led counseling service that, you know, has trained, qualified, you know, therapists from African and Caribbean backgrounds. We provide in bereavement support, peer support. We're dealing with, you know, complex bereavement and, and trauma. And what we know is the mainstream services are not seeing the number of black people we see so it, you know in terms of service provision you know it, it has been phenomenal where we can provide support and people who have been bereaved 10 years ago are now coming to the service asking for support and they know they can be listened to and then there are a range of you know other services we've had to develop you know around suicide prevention and you know addiction and gambling and all that and, and when it comes to our services and program, the strap line we use is culturally appropriate and racially sensitive, you know, services. And, and, and we, we're not shy to talk about faith. So whether, you know, is utilizing church leaders or imams, because we know within the black population, then they are, faith is a key part of, of our people's identity. And so we don't shy away. In my organization, we have two church liaison officers. We also have a, a, a black Muslim imam that works with us and, and we reach out to others so that we can go. We've been running lots of health checks. We started a pre-pandemic yes. and we, you know, delighted that on Sundays or at community events, we run them. And when we ref we've, we've screened over a thousand, referred over 50%. And, and sometimes, you know, quite really serious readings. And, and, and it means that people have had the, you know, necessary healthcare support because of the outreach we've done. So those are some of the impact, but also just last Thursday, and, and this is, I say this with all humility and it's testament to the work we do. You know, I was named as uh, one of the top 50 most influential BAME people in health in the UK. And that's just testament to, you know, the work of the Caribbean African with my colleagues, but also the endorsement we have. We're sitting on different boards, which helping shape policy. We helping shape research and 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 driving things in the right direction. And I think what we've been brilliant as talking about impact is how we able to triangulate people's lived experience in thematic ways to help policymakers and help service providers really tailor what they do 
you know, for people from marginalized communities. And it's been a real delight, you know, up and down the country. We work with some amazing, you know, BAME led organizations. So we're learning from our South Asian brothers and sisters, whilst we also share what we've learned. And, and that's how collectively, you know, we're shaping things in the right direction. Thanks so much for Charles sharing that, Charles, and congratulations. I mean, it sounds like there's so much impact you're making, and it's great to know that uh, you and your organization, of course, are are being, you know, well recognized, and they're becoming like Thank a you. really big Manchester institution in a very short span of time. Because it's just 2017. That's not that's not very long ago. Thank you. How can interested people reach out to you and learn more about Khan or maybe join some of these workshops and webinars that you're organizing? Thank you. So so we, we are present on social media. So Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Reddit, TikTok. You know, just look out for CHN, you know, UK or the Caribbean African Health Network. Our Saturday morning, Katip, you know, so Katip is Caribbean African uh, health, you know, targeted health improvement program. And and we do, we run those webinars with five other partners, two in London, Leeds, Birmingham, Sheffield. And and it's always on, on you know, live on our YouTube platform. But also we have a Tuesday session on, on nutrition and physical activity. And once again, you can drop us a line, you know, info at khan.org.uk or to assess any of our services, whether it's around advocacy or, you know, uh, therapeutic intervention, you can email help at khan.org.uk. We also run a helpline, you know, so feel free to either text WhatsApp or call for those in the UK, 077100 double two three eight two so social media our website you know and feel free to drop us a line and and someone would definitely come back to you thanks so much for sharing that and i'll include your website in the uh, episode notes as well so that people can easily find it thank you what advice would you have for people looking to start something similar in another part of the world or another part of the uk that, that's a great question. I mean, you know, what I'll say and, and the strength of the Caribbean African Net- Net- Network, Khan, you know, the strength of Khan has been collaboration and partnership building. So right from 2017, the commitment we made to the community is not to compete with other Black-led organizations, but to collaborate, to enhance what others are doing. Because no one organization will have all the solutions. So right from the outset, being intentional about how you're going to collaborate. So if you are an organization, you just focus on cancer, you know, understand what is already happening. And I think cultural, there's a cultural thing about celebrating those who have gone ahead of us, you know, so those who have been there for 20, 30 years, yes, you may have a brilliant idea. You may be digitally strong, but they will have some taxing knowledge because they've been there and they've done it. That will enhance what you do. So collaboration, partnership building. And I think, you know, that cross-sector working. So, yes, there may be challenges with the criminal justice system, but you can't shy away from there. You need to sit around those tables where, you know, you can influence. And I think sometimes when people have talked about racism and discrimination. They've said, no, I'm not engaging with this organization. I'm not touching this. I'm not going here. I'm not going to speak to them. That will do you a disservice to the vision you have. I think it's about that respectful approach, not pointing fingers at individuals because nobody's perfect and there will always be challenges. There will always be more room for improvement. So that positive asset-based approach where you want to collaborate and partner up, celebrating others. So we're not afraid as an organization to celebrate others. We're not afraid to signpost others, you know, to stakeholders who want to engage. And and having that sense of humility, because it's a marathon. This, this whole journey of social impact and change is marathon. And nobody can do it. 
So in, in Khan, we have relationships with the university, with our Greater Manchester Police, with local authorities, with the acute trust. And then maybe I'll chip in this example. When people told us that there were issues with one of the biggest trust in hospital trust in Manchester, what we did was to speak to the, the their senior leaders and ask them to have a series of ongoing engagement with our community as a way of rebuilding trust. So finally, you know, no one organization can solve it all. Together we're stronger. A sense of humility, but a real focus on your mission, your purpose, and how you complement what others do. So if there are services running Monday, Wednesday, and you want to do the same thing, go for Tuesday, Friday, you know, and talk to them, share volunteers, Sometimes go along to other organizations and learn from what they're doing. That is how collectively, when we're stronger, we can bring about, you know, significant change. Thank you. That's a really great trip. And uh, it looks like you're doing that very successfully. And uh, it's a it's a really good one. And I'm sure listeners will appreciate that. It's an opportunity now for you to talk about anything that I haven't asked you about, maybe something coming up in the next couple of months or any winter focus you want to call out. Yeah, th thanks, Deepa. So, yes, I want to remind people about Saturday morning sessions. It's on every Saturday morning, you know, on Zoom, YouTube and Facebook live. But also in the first two weeks of December, we're going to be running a, a blood pressure monitor campaign. So encouraging people to know their numbers. We want to give out some blood pressure monitors for free and encourage people to think about those who could benefit within their family and friend circle and, and, and to really, you know, give that out as a Christmas gift because, yes, it's good to buy toys and clothes and all that, but health is wealth. And then within the city of Salford, we're going to be running a vitamin D campaign. We know you know, black and brown people have low levels, you know, so I want to encourage people, yeah. buy a tub of vitamin D, get like 2,000 or more, you know, international units and, and, and look after yourself, really. So those are my parting messages. In the UK, we're privileged to have free healthcare, so make sure you register with a GP. With the winter around the corner, there's a call out for people to have boosters, as well as their flu jabs. And, and all we want to say to people is look after yourself because it's only when you're well and strong that is when you can look after your loved ones and, and spread the word. Health is well. Let's look at what we eat. Let's make sure we keep in active and moving. And, you know, let's really engage with services. And, and then finally, for us as, you know, minority people, our voice matters. If you assess a service and you weren't treated well, in a constructive, positive way, let people know. Because by speaking out in a constructive way, then we will be shaping the landscape for our children's children and generations after us. Thanks for sharing that. Now, the signature questions that I ask all my guests, and uh, first one is, can you describe the Mancunian spirit in a word or a phrase? Resilient. Great one. Can you share a Mancunian who inspires you and why? And this could be somebody who's living or dead. I'll say the Dean of Manchester. He, he is of Indian ethnicity, but, you know, a, a South of, born in South Africa. And he's been a real role model, you know, around community cohesion and community resilience and, and challenging hate and discrimination. But also for many years, he was the first black dean in, in the Church of England. You need to name him as well, Charles, please. Okay. So 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 that's the uh, very uh, uh, Reverend Dean Rogers, Govinda MBE, the Dean of Manchester. Thanks so much for sharing that. That I must look him up. What's the most important life lesson you've learned so far? I think it, it's it's, you know, humility and recognizing one's own weakness and challenges. Yeah, it's a good one. I thought you'd choose focus, but this is also a really good one because you sounded like you're extremely focused. You've got the eye on the goal. You're going to change that vision. Um, if you could have one superpower, 
what would that be? I think it will be the ability to increase knowledge in, in, in those that can influence. Because if, if you if you give out, you know, food, clothes, and, you know, I've been running a food bank for, you know, over nine years now, people will always need more. But knowledge is power and skilling people up could could bring about transformational shift. Thank you for sharing that. I, I have that personal experience from seeing I worked with a slum char slum based charity in Delhi and the first generation that went to college, parents have been in the slums, children going to college, children mm. getting good jobs, getting PhDs, and that transforming the mm. entire generation because they became role models. So absolutely yeah. very, very good one. Is there a funny story you'd like to ask, uh, you'd like to share with listeners? And that could be something from Manchester, something from your work. Oh, well, funny story. I, I, I remember in, you know, my, my second trip to the UK in, in 2002, and it, it was in February. And uh, I, I needed to, you know, go to Colchester and I had friends over there. Well, I, I mean, a friend was meant to have picked me from you know, the train station. And I, I had difficulty bringing this friend. And, and so I had to spend a night in a telephone booth. But because I was quite naive and quite new, you know, I was in the phone booth. And whenever I had, and this was in London, by the way, and when I had the police car passing, then I'll pick the handset as if I'm making a phone call because I was really frightened you know, of the police and coming to interrogate me and make, yeah, because clearly, you know, when, you, before you arrived, you gave the address of where you were going to live and all that, you know, and I, I was with my auntie and I was going to this friend in Colchester from London, but my friend wasn't picking the phone. So whenever I had the siren go, then I picked the handset as if I'm speaking to someone on the phone in, in one of those BT boots. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you that's a good one that's all i have for today so thanks so much charles this is really fascinating and it's amazing how much impact khan has been able to make in this uh very short period five years is a short period of time for the life of a charity because you said 2017 to now and it's just really amazing yeah, th th thanks, Deepa. It's been a real privilege and having that opportunity to serve, you know, the community. And, and I think the impact we've made, but also we continue to, as well as the work we're able to do, wouldn't have been possible without the support of people of all race and backgrounds and creeds and sexuality and all that. And, you know, it's been that intersectional approach. So whether is engaging with disabled people's groups, the LGBTQ, you know, I come, you know, it just goes on and on. And and it's that intersectional approach and, and building collaborations across, you know, all sectors. Those have been really instrumental in, in where we are. Thank you for sharing that. It's been so nice to talk Thank to you. you. So massive thanks to you all for taking time to listen and, and thanks to Deepa for the opportunity. Charles, I really enjoyed learning about supporting health and well-being today. Dear listener, thank you so much for listening to the ninth episode of the Meet the Mancunian podcast, Season 4. I hope this episode and the podcast itself encourages you to follow your passions, inspired by the amazing Mancunian guests who feature here. Tune in every Tuesday for a new episode or log on to www.meetthemancunian.co.uk to listen to all the episodes and learn more about my podcasting story. Next week on Tuesday, 26 January 2023, the Meet the Mancunian podcast talks to Nidhi Sinha about integration. Please do leave a review or a voice message on my website www.meetthemancunian.co.uk it takes only a few minutes. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.